Okay, good evening. It is April 20, Tuesday, 6 p.m. And it is now week six. Week six. So in, uh, in two weeks, we'll have laboratories on campus and that will be for uh, uh, week eight. I will post the exact dates and um, also a potential uh, makeup date. And that will most likely be a Saturday, but again, if you can't make those dates, I need to know so that we can um, either one or two things, either schedule a makeup session. You know, if you uh, don't feel comfortable in coming on campus with a group, we can do one on one or an alternative assignment like, you know, like a term paper or something. But I highly suggest take advantage of your laboratory. And oh, by the way, you pay a laboratory fee, which is non refundable. So um, if you would like to come back and uh, play with, you know, uh, any of the specimens in the future, like, you know, when we all come back to campus regularly, just give me a call, stop right in. You're, you're more than welcome at any of our laboratories. We are also now playing, uh, we just had a meeting today and we're playing around with, um, with the idea of having an open laboratory, uh, meaning, um, you know, like there'll be a laboratory at a certain time, like on a Thursday or Friday or a Saturday morning, and you just come in whenever you want. Uh, you just pick a date, uh, you uh, make a schedule and come in. So, you know, uh, shoot me an email or a text on your thoughts on that, on open laboratories, you know, like a laboratory that's just open and you just walk in, you do your laboratory and you be done with it. So there isn't a, like a, a set schedule. Um, there's pros and cons to that, and I'll be sharing more about that uh, later on. Hold up. There's one more person. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm missing one. And who is it? I have that person. I have that person. Uh, hold up. You know what? I'll do it later because we got to start. So what's due today? Task five, discussion five, lesson five, that's due today. And uh, I'll even give you till tomorrow morning because I see only, you know, some of you are reeling from uh, last week's midterm. So uh, go right ahead, try to post that. I won't really start looking at grading unless you already submitted it already until tomorrow. Now, what are we doing tonight? And what's due, of course, next week is task six, discussion six and lesson six. And what are we doing tonight? <clears throat> We're doing the cardiovascular system, chapter 19 in your textbook. Now, this is, uh, this is a little bit on the challenging side, um, but let's break it down because this is not only, uh, uh, it's actually this week is two chapters. So chapter 19, which is the heart itself, and chapter uh, 20, which are the blood vessels and circulation. And I'm gonna make the, um, the blood vessels and circulation a little bit uh, easier, um, little, a uh, little less coverage, but definitely we're gonna cover um, the heart itself. So let us now go to chapter 19 in our textbook, OpenStax. Do, 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 do. And table of contents. We're gonna scroll all the way down to 19. And we're gonna look at the anatomy. Hint, hint, you know, when we hit up the textbook, doesn't this look like a nice way to start your concept map, right? You just write cardiovascular system and then you have an arrow to this, arrow to that, arrow to this, arrow to that, so on and so forth. Make your life easy, okay? Okay, let's begin. Ugh, I hate that. Okay, so the first thing we have to talk about is, where is your heart? Well, it is in your media steinum, which is in your thorax, which is here in your chest. And you will notice that your heart is about the size of your fist. And it's a little bit more on the left side of our patient, right? Remember our patient here, right? This is their left, this is their right. Okay, and you have the apex, which is right here, and the heart is covered 
in a, uh, we're going to see that in um, our dissection, it's covered by a, um, a fibrous covering called your pericardium, okay? And it protects your heart. And it also has two layers that have uh, fluid inside of them. So it also decreases the amount of friction because the heart is moving. And every time you have movement, you're going to have friction. So you have the pericardial, uh, uh, pericardium, which is this dotted line covering around your heart and some of your great vessels. And here's your larynx, here's your trachea, uh, here's your uh, aortic arch, your superior vena cava. Now you will notice the conventions. The red tubes, uh, blood vessels are uh, tubes that have oxygenated blood. The blue are deoxygenated blood. So what does that mean to us? It means that the red blood cell in this aorta, which is the largest diameter artery in your body, the majority of blood is oxygenated. The red blood cell is carrying oxygen, most of it. Now in the blue, which is a vein, the majority of the red blood cell is carrying carbon dioxide, okay? So doesn't that look like a beautiful picture that I can ask? What's this? Is this oxygenated or deoxygenated? What's this? Oxygenated or deoxygenated? What's this blue thing? What's this red thing? Blue thing, red thing. You will also notice that the heart, we're gonna see that the heart has four chambers. You can't see the larger chambers down here, but the, um, the smaller chambers, and this is exaggerated for teaching purposes, but you'll see how small they are when we, uh, we cut up a heart in, in the laboratory in a couple of weeks. This is your left atrium. The old school way is calling it an oracle. And here's your right atrium. And remember, when you're looking at this perspective, this side is the right side of your patient. This side is the left side of your patient. And of course, you have your left lung here, right lung here, left lung has a cardiac notch, and that's why your heart is situated a little bit more towards the left side. And it's located in your media steinum in your thoracic cavity, okay? You have your great vessels here and the apex or the pointiness of that heart is right here. And you can see here when, and uh, they're doing CPR and compressions so we can uh, pump blood when the heart isn't working very well. Let's look at now this monstrosity right here. How easy would it be for me to take this thing, erase all of these and just put A, B, C, D, E, F, G and make that uh, part of your final exam or part of a lab quiz? How easy would it be? It'd be easy, right? And hint, hint, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is gonna be on your final. And uh, you, need, uh, you need to see it. So how are we gonna look at this? First, you always have to look at orientation. So remember, what's this side of the heart? That is the, pause for effect, left side. How about this side of the heart? That is the right side, okay? So the right side, you'll see the majority of it is deoxygenated. So that means the red blood cell is carrying carbon dioxide and the right side is oxygenated. And that means the red blood cell, the majority of it is carrying the oxygen. So oxygenated, deoxygenated. Wouldn't that be a, an exam question? If I pointed at the aorta, I'd ask you, is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? And of course, um, on my exams, it'll be of course in color. So you'll be able to see it and you know it's red means it's oxygenated. How about if I pointed at this, uh, these pulmonary arteries? Oh, that's deoxygenated. How about this superior vena cava? Deoxygenated. Inferior vena cava, de deoxygenated. So we could do this all day. So that's one kind of, another would be just straight up identification. Now I could ask you, what's this? That's the apex. What are all these? These are the great vessels of your heart. Now. Now we know that this is the um, uh, left side. Now this is the right side, because remember, we're looking at it like we're looking at Joe Patient right here, okay? So Mr. Patient, this is his right side, this is his left. Now remember, look at these answers. 
if you answer right pulmonary artery when it's supposed to be left pulmonary artery, then it's wrong. It's not half point because you got you you, you got half of it because we're in we're in healthcare. We have to be exact. So the first thing I want you to look at is now that you know right and left, you know the two rooms or the two chambers on the top have to be atria. So this has to be your left atrium, and the two big rooms on the bottom have to be your ventricles. So this is your left ventricle. So I could ask, what's this? Left atrium. What's this? Left ventricle. What's this? Right ventricle. What's this? Right atrium. So that's right off the top. Now, you have AV valves or atrioventricular valves. You have a set here and you have a set here. This AV valve is called your mitral valve, also known as your bicuspid valve. This one here on the right side is called your tricuspid because there's three of them. Well, you don't really picture it here, but we'll show you on a better picture uh, and we're definitely gonna show you it in dissection. So that's the tricuspid valve. That's the bicuspid valve. And that's an AV valve between your atrium and ventricles. So this is my right atrium, right ventricle. Then you will also notice, we've already mentioned that this right side, that's your pulmonary circulation. This left side, the red side, and that's your systemic circulation because the blood coming out of your uh, left ventricle is going out into the aorta and going the rest of your system under high pressure. And that's why it's going in an artery. And blood coming back to your heart is under low pressure because uh, veins are, and we're gonna talk more about that in a moment, veins are low pressure. So they just fall right in here from your superior vena cava to your inferior vena cava. Now, after it goes into the right ventricle, it's gonna go into your lungs, hence the term pulmonary artery. And an artery is something that goes away from your heart. Vein, it's coming back to your heart, okay? And we're gonna talk more about uh, arteries, veins, and capillaries when we get hit up the next chapter. But right now, this picture, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb. That's gonna come out. It's gonna come out big time. And for those of you who had um, uh, EKG before or um, uh, phlebotomy, uh, you should already know this. This should be like the back of your hand. Well, maybe not the back of your hand, but maybe pieces of it. Okay, let's move on. So this is the circulation. So you notice that the right side goes to your lungs hence the term pulmonary, and the left side goes to your systemic, okay? Membranes, features. This is a very uh, important, but very easy medical terminology slash uh, um, cardiac physiology question or cardiac anatomy question. There are layers to the heart because when you get a heart attack, the heart attack is graded and staged um, depending on how deep the damage is. So if you only have the damage on the outer layer, our fibrous pericardium, remember we uh, mentioned that, there were two layers. You have this um, uh, outer layer right here, which is your fibrous pericardium. And then you have your uh, inner layer, right? Which is your visceral layer which is part of your uh, epicardium. So think of it this way. The best way to deal with it is use your medical terminology powers. Peri means surrounding. So the fibrous pericardium has to be on the outside. And think of the thing that's gonna protect you the most has to be the most fibrous, the toughest thing. So you have a visceral and parietal layer of your pericardium and your parietal layer has to be where? Up top and your visceral layer has to be on the inside connected to your epicardium. So you have a visceral layer and a, I mean a parietal layer and your visceral layer. And this is how I remember who's who. Viscera, if you recall your medical terminology powers, viscera means guts. So which is the closest one to your guts is your visceral layer of your pericardium. 
So again, fibrous pericardium, parietal layer, visceral layer. Now, in between the parietal layer and the visceral layer, you have this uh, potential space, and that's your pericardial cavity, and it has fluid in it. And the function of the pericardial fluid is to decrease um, friction when the heart is pumping. Now, the bad thing is if this thing fills up with blood or if this thing fills up with pus, that's bad news. It's just like a bag that got really tight. It's going to tighten up your heart and it's going to cause a whole bunch of problems. The next big, big layer is the myocardium. Myo is the muscle. And essentially, that's what the heart is. It's a muscle that pumps. Pumps what? Pumps the blood. It pumps it to the outside world on the left side, which is the systemic circulation. And it pumps to the lungs on the right side. And that's your pulmonary circulation. So that's your myocardium. And then deep, deep in the inside is your endocardium. So if my patient has a myocardial infarct, which is a heart attack, and it's at the endocardial layer, how much trouble is my patient in? They have damaged full thickness. That's bad news. Typically, heart attacks usually get up to the epicardium around here if it's a relatively mild heart attack, and it only damages some of the myocardium, and that's a mild heart attack. So when you hear stuff mild or severe heart attack, when they're talking about like a severe heart attack, a severe myocardial infarction, think endocardial damage, think the inside. And remember, uh, whoever designed us, designed us pretty darn perfect with all the tough stuff on the outside and all the soft stuff, delicate stuff on the inside. So if you have valvular damage, like in this um, mitral valve or this tricuspid valve, tricuspid valve, who gets damage of that a lot? Drug addicts, uh, heroin addicts, they get this damage here. You have endocardial damage. There's not much we could do. It's really, you get into a, really a lot of trouble. So if you ever want to do heroin, you bought yourself a nice heart condition on top of it. And cardiac tamponade, uh, pericardial tamponade or cardiac tamponade is when the pericardium starts filling up with either blood or pus, and then it starts squeezing on the heart. And that's a no bueno situation. Oh, looky here. Do you think I could ask this question? Sure. Do you think I could just erase all of this and put A, B, C, D, E, F, G? So how's this? Why don't you take this picture, copy and paste it onto, I don't know, Microsoft Word or whatever, then uh, electronically or even physically, maybe put a piece of tape over this and, and then practice all this for the next, for every day until, until, um, until finals. Then you'll ace this portion of the exam. So how do you know between front and back? What looks different? This is the back part. This is the front part. What looks different? Okay, survey says, do you see this atria? It's more prominent in the front. Do you see any atria? Yeah, you see a little bit of your left atrium here. Another thing you'll notice is, hey, wait a minute. This thing right here, which is the great cardiac vein and your anterior interventricular artery, also known as your left anterior descending artery, which is, by the way, the most common blockage for a heart attack right here, right? That's how you know you're in the front, okay? And this is a interventricular sulcus or a groove that fits the great cardiac vein and the anterior interventricular artery, also known as your LAD, which is your left anterior descending artery. So I could point at this. If you know that this is your anterior interventricular sulcus or groove that houses the great cardiac vein and your AIA, which is an anterior interventricular artery, then you know that this has to be the left ventricle, this has to be the right ventricle, right? You also, uh, and these are your coronary arteries, all these little things right here, right? And these coronary arteries, if they get clogged, you get a heart attack, and then that um, if they get clogged, it can't feed the muscle of your heart. And if it doesn't feed the muscle of your heart, what happens to the heart? It will die. Okay. And if it starts dying, what about the, uh, do you think the heart will pump uh, very well? No, it won't. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of problems. 
And you see this artery goes all the way to the back, hence the term circumflex. You have your superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. You have your left and right pulmonary veins, and they're uh, they're um, oxygenated, of course. And then, of course, here you have your left pulmonary artery, which is deoxygenated. And this is just a little the ligamentum. Uh, eh, nice to know, ligamentum arteriosum. It just keeps all this together. And it's a ligament, it connects things to things. So you got your apex. So know how, know the difference between anterior and posterior. So now you know what anterior, the two major things. You have your uh, interventricular sulcus and it's kind of going down towards the apex. And remember this for, for laboratory and your atria are sitting up front. So when you look at this, could that be a question? Is this the front or the back? And you'll tell me, oh, this is the front. And you could tell me why. Now, this is the back. You notice there's no uh, atria in the back. It's mostly the entrances to all these uh, pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. And you could see you have two sets. You have a left one and your right one because you have your left lung and you have a right lung. Now, the big thing about uh, the posterior portion or the posterior view of the heart is when you look at this now, now that it's you're looking at the backside, this is the left side of your patient now, and this is now the right side. So if I'm pointing at this, this has to be your left atrium. If I'm pointing at this, this has to be the uh, left ventricle. If I'm pointing at this side, it has to be the right ventricle. And look at here, you have your posterior interventricular artery, right? And that's in between this ventricle and this ventricle, all righty? And the back view of your superior vena cava and the back view of your inferior vena cava that's coming up here. And of course, all of that is oxygenated and you have the aortic arch right here as well. So my best bet or my best advice is take this, uh, even look online. Here, you didn't even have to look at it. Watch this. Why make it, why do it uh, uh, the hard way? Can I just do this, do this? Oh, look at here. And there's online practice. Do you think I could do this all day? And then you go in there and there's probably a game. Oh, look at here. What's this? I don't know. I click on it and I play the game or whatever, you know, and try to match it up to whatever. There's a whole bunch of these free things. Uh, press play, I guess, wherever play is. I don't know. But you could see, oh, here it is. You did, like, oh, what's this? Oh, that's the aorta. Oh, I wonder what's this. Oh, that's left and right. You could do that all day, right? Why, why reinvent the wheel? You know, and I already told you, it's coming out. You need to know it. You need to know it from multiple classes. So definitely know this, definitely know this, definitely know the difference between front and the difference between back. Uh, atrial musculature, no, no, no. Internal structures of the heart. Okay. Again, we're looking at the internal structures and we open things up. So all of this stuff, we're going to now focus on all the valves and what's in the inside. Now, of course, this is the left side because, uh, and this is the right side because my patient is now facing me. So we already know this valve. It's on the left side. It is your mitral valve, also known as your bicuspid. You notice there's two little papillary muscles connected to two chordae tendinae and connected to the valve itself. Hence the term bicuspid, also known as your mitral valve. And if you look on the right side, there's one, two, three papillary muscles connected to chordae tendinae and connected to the tricuspid valve. Hence the term one, two, three, or tri, tricuspid, because a cusp is like a, like a leaflet or a valve, okay? So if I, if I point at this, you're gonna tell me papillary muscle. If I point at this, you're gonna tell me chordae tendinae. And if I point at this, you're gonna tell me, oh, that's my mitral valve, also known as your bicuspid. If I point at this, you'll tell me, oh, that's tricuspid valve because it's on the uh, right side of my patient. And it's one, two, three, chordae tendinae and connected to one, two, three papillary muscles, okay? And you'll notice, how do I know I'm in the ventricles? You see all this rough uh, branches? 
because your ventricle is under high pressure. And since it's under high pressure, it has to have a thick wall. See this interventricular septum? That's a lot of muscle. That's all thick, 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 thick. And that's why it has to have a rough uh, um, um, endocardium right here. And that's called your trabeculae carnae or carniae to be exact. Carniae means meat. Trabeculae means branches. So big, these big branches of meat. Now let's look at the uh, semilunar valves. You got one here and you got one here. Now, since we know on the right side, it's got to go to my lungs and uh, goes to my lungs via my pulmonary artery right here. So this has to be the pulmonary semilunar valve. And you could kind of use your imagination, kind of looks like a half crescent moon here. So hence the term semilunar valve. And here's your aortic semilunar valve because it's coming from the left ventricle here and through your aorta, which is your largest artery out into your systemic circulation. So what are the key ones for this picture? Are the valves, this one, this one, this one, this one, chordae tendine, trabeculae carne, papillary muscles here, interventricular septum here. Myocardium is the thick wall. Now, do you notice the atrium has nice smooth walls? And it makes sense because when the, uh, uh, when the blood comes into your atria, it comes under low pressure. That is your diastolic pressure. And when it leaves your ventricles, that is your systolic pressure. If you guys remember, systolic and diastolic, isn't the systolic the higher pressure coming out of your ventricles? That's the higher blood pressure when you have a blood pressure of 120 over 80. 120 millimeters of mercury is what they measure regarding the pressure in your ventricles. And the 80, 80 millimeters of mercury is the pressure going into your atria, also known as your diastolic pressure. So systolic, it's the higher number. Diastolic is the lower number. Systolic is the pressure at which blood gets ejected from both ventricles. And the diastolic pressure is the pressure at which the uh, blood just falls right into these lovely atria right here. Okay, so now you can actually tell your patient exactly what systolic and diastolic really mean. Why the real, the, the big number, what it really means. It means the pressure at which your ventricles are pushing out blood. And the um, diastolic blood pressure is the pressure at which the blood returns back to the heart into the atria. Oh, look at here, an actual photograph. You got the little finger like, right? Oh, it's right here. You have your trabeculae carne right here, which is the, um, you know, the branches. But if you look at here, don't they look like little fingers? These your papillary muscles, then your chordae tendine, and then they attach onto here, which is this leaflet right here. Neat, huh? That's inside you right now. Here's another look at your uh, bicuspid and tricuspid valve. Like if I cut the top of the heart off and here's another view of your semilunar valves, your pulmonary. And how do I know it's pulmonary? Well, because it's pointing to it, but I know it because it's what? Deoxygenated. Remember, your right side of your heart is deoxygenated because it has to go back to your lungs to be reoxygenated. And once it becomes oxygenated, that's the left side. And that's when it's going to push out of the aortic semilunar valve and then go into the rest of the world to be, uh, you know, so we can utilize the oxygen because we need that oxygen. Uh, da, 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 that's nice. Well, you know what? Let me see if we're keeping track on what we need to know. We always have to check. So structure of the, uh, structure and function of the heart, we're, that's what we're going. Arteries, veins, and capillaries, we'll go over that. And we're gonna do it over cardio, cardiovascular physiology in a moment, when we talk about the, uh, how the circulatory system uh, and how the cardiac cycle works. So that's the next topic here. So now that you know kind of what the heart looks like, oh, look, here's some blockage. That's not good. The blockage here. <coughs> and that's an atherosclerotic plaque. 
it's full of fat and the fat got all um got all hardened up and what did it do to the lumen it made it super small and hypertension and all the bad things that are connected to it um i'm just going to mention just a little bit of what what makes uh um what makes cardiac muscle cells so unique well they have these things called intercalated discs the discs naturally store calcium and uh we're going to talk about that when we talk about why is calcium so important well remember your heart needs to jump start things right and needs a little spark and needs a little bit of electricity well that's where it comes from, from these calcium channels, okay? And the neat thing about cardiac muscle is it forms what they call a syncytium. See these connections here? Oh, uh, well, here, this connection here, this gap junction. And syncytium means that if one heart cell pumps at a rate of 100 beats per minute or whatever, once it comes in contact with another heart cell, that second heart cell will also beat at 100 beats per, mi uh, per minute. So they were all contract all together. And that's why the heart has to contract in an organized fashion. And we'll be talking about, well, let's talk about it right now since we're here. Let us talk about the conduction system of the heart, which is part of the physiology. Now, the heart's a muscle. In order for a muscle to contract, you need a nerve. And the nerve has to be connected to your brain. So the nerve in question that controls the heart is your cranial nerve 10, which is written like a Roman numeral X, and that's called your vagus nerve. And let's now go to a nice video. Uh, what was it called? Uh, conduction. System. It's this one. It's like the easiest one. I've been using this video for like, I don't know, 10 years plus. So let's look at this on how the conduction system of the heart works. Okay, why is there no sound? The car okay, in good. the right yeah, conduction system. All right, okay, take two. Okay, here it is. The cardiac conduction system consists of the following components. The sinoatrial node, or SA node, located in the right atrium near the entrance of the superior vena cava. This is the natural pacemaker of the heart. It initiates all heartbeat and determines heart rate. Electrical impulses from the SA node spread throughout both atria and stimulate them to contract. The atrioventricular node, or AV node, located on the other side of the right atrium near the AV valve. The AV node serves as electrical gateway to the ventricles. It delays the passage of electrical impulses to the ventricles. Okay. SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. It beats around 100 beats per minute, but that's a little fast for us. For a normal, for a normal adult human being, so you have this thing called the atrioventricular node, also known as the AV node. These, this is the delay, and I like to call it the brakes. So that's why your resting heart rate should be, you know, around the 60s, you know, to be normal, right? Um, you know, anywhere from like, you know, well, I don't want to get into. It. But just know that it's much, much lower because the AV node slows everything down. And that's the brakes. And it requires time for the blood. See the blood, how it's seeping out here? Of course, the deoxygenated blood on the right side and the oxygenated blood on the left, right? So it goes from the SA node to AV node. So the AV node is the brakes, B-R-A-K-E-S of your heart. And your SA node is the pacemaker. This delay is to ensure that the atria have ejected all the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. The AV node receives signals from the SA node and passes them onto the atrioventricular bundle, AV bundle or bundle of his. 
This bundle is then divided into right and left bundle branches, which conduct the impulses toward the apex of the heart. The signals are then passed onto Purkinje fibers, turning upward and spreading throughout the ventricular myocardium. Electrical activities of the heart can be recorded in the form of electrocardiogram, ECG, or EKG. Now, you don't need to know this part, but uh, for all of you just out of curiosity, first the atria have to contract. So it's this little bump right here. Then there's a space, right? The AV node creates that, that break and that time. And then the ventricles, this big wave, this is your QRS complex. That's when that, and then your T wave resets everything. So let's look at, let's look at a picture of uh, your, uh, a little bit less complicated picture of your electrical conduction system, your heart. Well, it's a nice one that I like. It has all, now you'll see that it's colored yellow because uh, remember, um, it's not colored yellow in real life, but yellow is the universal color for fat and nerves because your nerves are, are the insulation for your nerves. Guess what? It's fat. So fat. So if someone calls you a fat head, tell them, you know what? You're not even smart enough to know that's a compliment because uh, that's what your brain is made mostly of fat. So you have. So let's say, for example, I have this diagram. And could I erase all of this and like A, B, C, D, E, F, G? If I point at this yellow thing, that's your SA node. It is located in the uh, superior portion of your right atrium, right next to the um, uh, entryway of your superior vena cava. Then your AV node, which is down here. Then you have your uh, bundle of Hiss. Uh, Hiss is the name of the, uh, uh, I believe he was a hemo uh, histologist. Who, who, who identified uh, this section of the heart. That's the bundle of Hiss that branches off into the left and right bundle branches and then into the Purkinje fibers. And it makes sense because you have to beat from your heart. It's got to start up here and then the blood goes down here. Then when these things pump, then it goes back up and out uh, into your uh, systemic and your pulmonary circulations. So for the exam purposes, I pointed this, SA node. Pointed this, AV node. Pointed this, bundle of Hiss. Pointed this, left bundle branch. Pointed this, right bundle branch. Pointed this, or this, or this, or this. That's Purkinje fibers. And Purkinje is the name of the guy who uh, found that, uh, uh, who discovered those nerves there. You're gonna hear, you're gonna see a lot of things like that in medicine. When I was younger, I wanted to like find like a Garias cell or something, call it that, so I could be in, uh, I can be in textbooks all day. Now, should I go over this? Well, we talked about calcium ions. Just know that calcium is required to start what they call an action potential. Okay, and what's an action potential? An action potential is that little tiny electricity that your EKG machine picks up. That is the signal that goes through the vagus nerve from your brain to your heart, to your SA, AV node, and, and sometimes they say the word firing, right? And that's what makes it pump, right? Signals it to pump. And we're not going to go over this EKG stuff because that's for a totally different class. Pressure, flow, we already talked about systolic versus diastolic. Remember, it goes uh, diastole, it goes is uh, when the blood flows back into your atria. Systole is when it flows out of your ventricles. And the systole is high blood pressure is or the higher pressure in the blood pressure. And your diastole is the lower number in your blood pressure. Okay. Now, heart sounds. What makes the heart sounds? 
Now, the heart sounds are made from the opening and closing of your valves. So you have opening and closing of your AV valves and opening and closing of your semilunar valves. And uh, if ever you're gonna study for your MCAT, please visit me before you decide to do that. Um, that's your medical college aptitude test. This is a big, big thing on the MCAT. Um, just know that your, the normal heart sounds are, there are only two of them, S1 and S2. Your S1 is the lub. And you know, when you listen to your heart with a stethoscope, you hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Well, lub is when uh, the uh, AV valve closes and the semilunar valves open up, right? And the dub corresponds to when the AV valves open and the semilunar valves close. Because just the, think of these valves as doors. And just like any door, if you open or close it, it's going to make a sound. Hence the term S1, S2. Now, any other goofy sound that's anywhere out here, that's called a murmur, right? That's caused by other things, either turbulent blood flow, abnormal uh, semilunar or atrioventricular valves. Oh, you can also see your atrial pressure. That's low, right? Look at that pressure in millimeters of mercury. That is called your diastole. But look at this ventricular pressure. Woo! Up to 120, right? And that's... Um, that's your uh, systole. Sorry, lots of words right there. And you could sit and memorize where these things go, but if you know where all the valves are, it's easy. Easy peasy. Uh, what do you need to know? Now, this is like the math of it all. Ugh. I don't want to introduce this, but there's something called cardiac output. Cardiac output is the measurement of exactly how much blood is uh, pumped by each ventricle per minute. And it's dependent on this mathematical equation of heart rate times stroke volume. Now, what's stroke volume? Now, that's the, um, where, where's the definition? So I can, you know what? The best thing to know is just this, right? These three terms, cardiac output, stroke volume, and heart rate. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So stroke volume is the amount, of, uh, uh, what do you call that? The amount of uh, blood pumped by each ventricle. Your heart rate, of course, is how many times or contractions or beats per minute. Now, what happens when the stroke volume decreases? In order for you to stay alive, your heart rate will increase. And that makes sense because these two are dependent on each other and for cardiac output. Or let's say, for example, for whatever reason, my heart rate drops, my stroke volume or the amount of blood that I pump or the strength of the, uh, of the contraction has to increase. Which by the way, this is actually how we play with um, our, our patient's uh, physiology in the emergency room. So let's say, for example, they lost a lot of blood. Of course, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put two lines in them and, and try to replace the blood. But, uh, but another thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make the um, I'm gonna make the blood pump, I mean the heart pump harder, right? So either the blood has to pump harder or has to pump more blood, and that's called your cardiac output. And your CO goes down. Uh, it's also um, uh, uh, it, we measure that a lot in, especially in the emergency room, especially with uh, uh, cardiovascular patients. These are the two techniques and the two things we consider. And you could see you could see here what affects heart rate. These things. What affects stroke volume? These things. Nice to know for the exam, but definitely know this. You're going to see this again. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. And know the definitions of all three of what they are. That's a nice quick question right there. Oh, this is what I was talking about. This is your cardiovascular nerves and. It's the main one is your vagus right here. And, but uh, the vagus is, serves uh, parasympathetic to slow down your heart. And you, of course, you have sympathetic uh, cardiac nerves uh, again to also do what? Increase your heart rate. And it's autonomic innervation, meaning to say is, do you have any control? No, you do not. Um, um, once the pit bull is in the room and it's chasing you, 
Is there any way or anything that you can do to calm yourself down? No, there isn't. And hence the term fight or flight response in the autonomic nervous system. Oh, Bainbridge, eh, I don't wanna talk about that. You'll get to that in, when you get to your pathology courses. Um, what else do I have to talk about? Thyroid, I don't know. Now we're getting into pharmacology and stuff like that. I don't wanna to touch that. So let's check now. Did we go over the cardiovascular system? Yes, we did. Uh, did we go over the heart? Yes, we did. How the heart uh, circulates? No, we didn't actually. Um, and that's the box diagram. And I'm going to put a video on that regarding the uh, cardiac cycle because I now, let me make a note of that. There's going to be another video and it's called the box. And it's going to talk about the cardiac cycle. And the cardiac cycle is the trace of a single drop of blood starting at your left atrium all the way out through the circulation. And um, here's also a nice video as well, but uh, watch my video on the box and I'm gonna put it on announcements. Um, so let's jump right into, oh, Carolina lab book. They have this lovely, you could jump into chapter 20, but again, like I said, I'm gonna keep it simple for blood and blood vessels. You click on this and that's in your uh, task, right? Again, don't do the lab, but do this. What do you need to know about blood? Okay, so the blood is uh, divided into two parts. Let's see, uh, blood into. Okay, and there's also, there's, all, there's this funky picture I saw a second ago, but here you go. You have the formed elements, which are the cells. So you're gonna have white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells. The majority of your blood is made out of red blood cells. And then if we centrifuge it and spin it down, the liquid portion of blood uh, um, after we spin it is called plasma. And this little tiny line is called the Buffy coat. So you could see we don't have too many white blood cells and we don't have any too many platelets. The majority of the things that we have in our blood are red blood cells. And here's a nice little percentage of it right here, okay? And this percentage between um, you know, 44 plus uh, one is 45. This per percentage between red blood cells and plasma, that's called your hematocrit which is spelled, close this, right here. And that's your hematocrit. The, the function of the hematocrit is to, um, to dictate the hydration status of your patient. So if you don't have that much plasma, that means you're dehydrated. So then I have to put more, uh, more fluid in you. And if you have way too much uh, plasma, then I have to do what? I got to flush you out with diuretics or, hey, stop putting uh, fluids in you. Now, we already talked about the red blood cells or erythrocytes. Their function is to carry things, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Those are the two main gases, but they also carry proteins. They also carry glucose, right? Hence the term glycosylated hemoglobin, which is uh, the part of the red blood cell, um, the hemoglobin part which is in the middle of the red blood cell uh, that carries things. Hemoglobin, hemo, blood, globin, protein, is that uh, four-part protein that's in the middle of your red blood cell. Leukocytes are easy. Um, that's your white blood cells. They help fight infection and whatnot. And platelets, of course, that has the role in homeostasis and uh, hemostasis, that makes sure that you don't bleed out, right? Now, do, 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 do. so that's your formed elements, RBC or erythrocytes. Now, the thing about your red blood cell is that, let's look at, you know what? Let's look at what they look like. You see these red blood cells? The majority of it is red blood cells. Well. You see how it's like, they call this biconcave disc. 
it looks like a lifesaver to me, right? And it's um, anucleated, meaning there's no nucleus inside here. There's hemoglobin. And you got the white blood cells, they fight off, they're for defense and immunity. And the platelets, they're these little tiny little things. And there's not a lot of them and they're for blood clotting. So here's a nice little picture here. You know, you could replay it back and because remember, I could ask you, so what's a formed element? Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Okay, which formed element has transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide? Red blood cells. Which uh, fights off infection? Uh, white blood cells. Which, uh, um, which uh, performs blood clots? Platelets. And that's the three things that we're measuring in a CBC or a complete blood count. And hematocrit is also part of that. Um, let's talk, uh, in these notes here, let's talk about the, if you looked at that picture in a minute, you see that the lymphocytes here and the monocytes, well, it's hard to tell here, but definitely the lymphocytes, they don't have a lot of granules in here, but you see the eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils, those are granulocytes, okay, because they have little granules here. And if you remember our lecture on uh, the, the parts on the inside of the cell, those are, uh, they have peroxides and also lysosomes that break down things. And that's what these things do. So you have a neutrophil, they perform phagocytosis. So they ingest bacteria, right? And if you got dead white blood cells and a bunch of uh, um, uh, dead bacteria, that's how you get pus. Okay, and that's why we got to get rid of it. Um, isonophils, right? We use the, um, those get increased when you have uh, larger things like parasites and also very active during allergic reactions. Um, your isonophils go up if you have an allergic reaction. They definitely go up when you have a parasitic infection. Now, basophils, uh, those um, uh, release histamine. So that means there's a significant inflammatory process going on if you have an increase of basophils. Now the agranulocytes, the lymphocytes and monocytes, those are your memory cells. They deal with antigen and antibody and uh, antigen and antibody uh, uh, production. Now what's antigen? Antigen are the protein coat on foreign cells and pathologic cells that say, hey, this is a bad cell go kill it. And that's where the memory comes in. That's where the antibodies come in. That's why you take vaccines. So you can have antibodies so that they can recognize the antigen on something like COVID and then go kill it in theory. Okay. And here is a lovely chart. Now I'm not going to, I could ask you, is it granulocyte or a granulocyte, but I'm definitely going to ask you, Hey, what's its function? Look at here, and a nice, right? And lymphocytes and monof lymphocytes definitely antibodies. Okay, think, uh, think vaccines. Think uh, viral. Look, hepatitis, mumps, measles, right? Hepatitis, mumps, and measles. Those are viral, and of course, in chronic bacterial infection. Thrombocytes, of course, are platelets, right? And we make new platelets. It's called thrombopoiesis. Okay, so that's blood essentially. Okay, now what about blood vessels? Okay, now we've already seen the red ones are typically arteries, but definitely the red ones are oxygenated and the blue ones are deoxygenated. And you could see here the right side is mostly deoxygenated, hence, that's what we call the uh, pulmonary circulation, right? because they got to go back to the lungs so the lungs can uh, oxygenate them. And the right side is oxygenated. And we all know that goes into our aorta from our left ventricle, right? And then goes out into the systemic, the systemic world. Now, when it goes out into the world and it goes into like a, um, um, let's look at capillary.
So the connection between the arterial world and the venous world is through capillaries. So let's say, for example, this is a capillary in my brain. Right now it's 655, hang in there, everybody, right? I need oxygen. I haven't eaten it for a while, right? My artery is going to go away from my heart and it's going to bring me oxygenated blood from my heart and the oxygen now will go to the capillary and then will go inside the cell, my brains, and then it's going to do some work. Now, the byproduct of utilizing oxygen we know is carbon dioxide. So now when oxygen goes into the brain, carbon dioxide has to go out and carbon dioxide goes out through pressures into the vein. And then the vein brings it back to my heart so that my heart can bring it to the lungs so I can uh, get more oxygen. And this thing gets repeated every time you breathe, every time you have a heartbeat. So think artery, oxygenated. Vein, deoxygenated. Capillaries, they're the thin lining, thin one cell thick that are in between the arteries and veins. And the capillaries are the location of gas exchange. I give carbon, I give oxygen, and I have to go get carbon dioxide out of my system. And we all know, we've all experienced what it's like when you don't have the carbon dioxide, uh, it doesn't get released from your system. Those of you who uh, you know work out or haven't worked out in a while, and then you run a couple of miles on the treadmill, you start getting cramping, it starts having pain. That's carbon dioxide buildup. And then it leads to acidosis because guess what? That carbon dioxide matches up with the hydrogen, right? In your, in your cells, right? And the more hydrogen ions in your cells, the more acidic you'll get. The more acidic, the more cramping. And uh, you'll get uh, lactic acid or lactic acidosis. Uh, and it's painful. That's where you get the cramping from. When you, you know, when you run and don't stretch and, and don't breathe right or haven't worked out in a while. So arteries typically leave the heart and they're typically oxygenated. Veins go back to the heart and they're typically deoxygenated. Now, remember I told you about the pulmonary circulation was a little bit special? Well, the pulmonary artery and vein is an exception. The pulmonary artery is deoxygenated and the pulmonary vein is coming back to the heart from your lungs so that's oxygenated. Now, what's the difference between arteries and veins? Let's look at this nice picture. And instead of uh, having a, you know, reading all those, I I'm a pictures guy. Eh, it's fuzzy. Where is, oh, look, a quiz. Oh, here's a nice one. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. There you go. So between the arteries and veins, and the our big artery becomes an arteriole, a big vein becomes a venule, right? And then they meet in the capillary, and that's where there's gas exchange. But let's look at the difference. If you look at the tunica media or the middle layer, the middle layer is filled with muscle. There's not much muscle in the vein. So there's a lot of muscle in the artery because the artery is under high pressure. The vein is under low pressure. So that's the biggest difference. High pressure artery with a thick tunica media and tunic means coat or coating, right? And that's the muscular layer. And you'll notice veins V has a valve because since it's such low pressure, you don't want, you want to prevent backflow. So you have these valves so that blood only goes one way. And if these valves start to fail, then you get varicose veins and claudication. And that's very, very painful. Okay. So I could ask you, what's the difference between the artery and vein? Well, you'll tell me, oh, arteries are typically oxygenated except for the pulmonary artery. Veins are typically deoxygenated, except for the uh, pulmonary vein. There are, other, there are other exceptions, but those are the main exceptions. Well, the artery has a thicker tunica media. 
Therefore, it's under high pressure. The vein has a very thin tunica media, so it's under low pressure. And it has a valve system that will prevent backflow of that low pressure system. Okay, and that's the difference between arteries and veins. And you could use the notes that go through that, or you could use, look at chapter 20. But I think, let's look at all of our stuff. Did we go over the heart? Yes. Blood circulation of the heart? Yes. Did we look at, uh, well, you could look at these nice notes here, but, um, and look at this circulation video. Did we look about blood and blood vessels? Yes. We talked about the circulatory system, function of the heart the difference between arteries, veins, and capillaries, and how does the heart pump, and the, um, what do you call that? The, uh, the conduction system of the heart, or the nerves that are related to the heart, and how the heart is connected to your brain through um, nerves. So from the look of it, looks like we went over everything. So wait, let's go over real quick on what's due for next week, of course always for task six due next week, concept map for what we talked over, right? And also uh, uh, this is thing about medical technology, share and discuss, watch the video, but yeah, you can watch the video or not watch the video. But when we mean by innovative idea, not something from four or five years ago, not even something from two years ago, because honestly, when you guys hear about medical term, uh, technology, um, uh, especially in the media, it's years. It's a, uh, we know about that stuff years ago, like 10 years ago. So try to find something from at, at worst 2020, but try to hit up innovative medical technology stuff that's enhancing people. And if you could find something with uh, the new technologies in cardiovascular system, that will be even better. Okay, again, 200, 200, 200 to 250 words and at least one seventh edition APA citation. Okay, and make sure to follow all that stuff that um, uh, Miss DeLeon talked about. Remember in the beginning of the term that we had uh, that training and um, we, um, we also have those PowerPoints in, um, in the announcements if you need to go over on, if you forgot how to do you know, citation or if it was still a little fuzzy. Now, lesson six, of course, don't do all of that. Look at the hot tub mystery, download the case, um, answer questions. You know what, answer all of them, they're, they're, they're easy. And remember, don't give me a paragraph. Some of you write me small book reports for some of these questions, you, you don't need to. And a lot, and a lot of the times, um, a lot of it is just, you know, your opinion and, 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 um, and the answers are kind of in here in the case itself, but worst comes to worst, Google it. That's acceptable as well. And for some of you who are a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit type a uh, kudos to you guys don't need citation for this. I, I, I get it. You're already, you're already putting in the citation for your discussion. So uh, don't don't worry yourself. So it looks like all questions, all parts for uh, this um, this lesson six. So with that being said, it is at this point in the show where I stop the.